All right. So, welcome already on a, on a cold January night. I bet I will see a, a whole bunch of people who, uh, in a minute, once I get the feed up on the Facebook, we'll probably see a whole bunch of people popping in on the Facebook because it's cold and they didn't want to come out tonight. And that's okay. We, we respect and honor their decision, and uh, we're glad that they're with us virtually. Uh, so let me get this up so I can interact if anybody's got questions. Go internet. There we go. And all right, so this is session three of our Understand and Study the Bible course on Wednesday nights. Um, hopefully, it is proving helpful and useful for you in your study. I hope last week's, you know, zoom through the whole Bible at a at a thirty thousand foot level was was helpful for you. And and that's really the, what we're doing last week and this week. It, uh, what I view as two keys to understanding the Bible. Uh, both are important, and I'm sure there's other important keys, but I got eight weeks, and so I got to choose what I talk about. Uh, what are the most important things from my perspective I can share in eight weeks? Uh, and so uh, last week we were up here, way up here with the big story of the Bible as the first key to understanding so that you don't get lost in where you are. Oh, Carla is definitely online. Hi, Carla. And tonight I'm going to introduce my second key to understanding. And we're going to go in the opposite direction. So last week we were way up here. This week we're going to, we're going to zoom in close. Very, very close to the passage that you are studying. Whatever that passage might be. And tonight you will need your Bibles. So if you don't have your Bibles, just know there's one in front of you. In the seat back and tray table in front of you. Uh, it'll be a slightly different translation than I read. It doesn't matter for our purposes um, because of what we're doing. You won't need it just yet, but... Um, fairly soon, uh, so it's nice. So I'm going to introduce the second key to understanding from my perspective, and this is going to sound probably like, really? You're going to be like, I paid for this? No, you didn't pay for this. But anyway. <laughs> key to understanding number two, read carefully in context. That's really it. Read carefully in context. We could call it done now and go home. If you would just all commit to read carefully in context. Because that sounds really, really simple. And it is really, really simple. Read carefully in context. But here's the thing. It takes a lot of discipline to read carefully in context. You really have to discipline your mind and almost still your mind before God. To consistently read carefully in context. And I will say that some of the sort of greatest errors we see in church life today, some of the greatest pseudo-Christian cults that are out there, all exist because they don't follow this rule. They don't read carefully in context. And so I, if there is nothing else that I can sort of hopefully instill in you over the next several weeks of this course, it is to read carefully in context. It's, Tonight I'm going to introduce this concept, read carefully in context, and then the next four weeks we're going to look at specific types of Bible passages and how to read them carefully in context while always being aware of the big picture of the Bible. So next week we're going to talk very broadly about how to work with Old Testament passages, reading them carefully in context while understanding the big picture of the Bible. And then I think the next week we look at narratives, and that's, you know, historical narratives, which some Old Testament, a lot of Gospels, you know, narratives, and we're going to talk about how to read those carefully in context while remaining aware of the big picture of the Bible. Uh, and then I think the week after that is poetry and prophecy, which is a very large percentage of uh, particularly the Old Testament. It's about a third of the Old Testament, uh, as well as some significant portions of the New Testament, how to read those carefully in context, while remaining aware of the big picture of the Bible. If I sound repetitive, it is, and that's intentional, because this is, it requires discipline. And then we will look at epistles, see the letters of Paul, and so forth. Uh, and then our final week will be on tools that can help you with stuff. So let's, I wanted, I decided to break this apart into two parts, and hi Angie, hi Mike, hi Jimmy, hi Carla, we got lots of people online right now, which is awesome, staying warm and, and indoors. I'm going to break it into two parts. First, I want to talk about what it means to read carefully. And you're going to be like, Brian, duh. 
And then we're talking about what it means to read in context. And then you just put those together. And what I'm going to be doing is, is building together so some principles and why it matters. But I'm going to be building for you a process of what it looks like to read a passage in context. Um, and again, I encourage you, if you've got the handout, or if you're in this room, go to the back and get the handout. If you're online, uh, if you've registered for the course or I've added you into the course, you'll get it, I'll email it out tomorrow. Uh, if you just want to stop by the church office and pick it up, that's okay too. Because the back of the handout is the process all together. About 13 steps. But I'm going to build it up one step at a time as we go through what it means to read carefully and what it means to read in context. So let's talk about reading carefully. We often assume that we know what a Bible passage says. Like particularly if we're, if we're churchy people. If we've been going to church every Sunday and Wednesday night for years and years and years, we often assume we know what a Bible passage says. Particularly if we've read it a lot of times. And so we have a tendency to not read it very carefully. Right? You don't have to nod and agree if you don't want to. I can just confess from my own experience. Right? That we have a tendency to say, ah, I don't need to read this carefully. Let me just skip to the bottom line. I know where the money verse is. I'm going to read the money verse. I'm going to get it, you know, I'm going to be reminded of the thing I'm supposed to do. I want us to become people who discipline ourselves to read the entire passage carefully. All of it. And, and as background, like what I'm telling you is like there's lots of systems for how to study and read the Bible out there or whatever. What I am communicating tonight is what I believe I do. And so, um, which actually made it very hard for me to put this together because I don't tend to think about what I do as I'm studying and preparing for a lesson, a, a Wednesday night, a Sunday sermon, a Saturday night sermon, or any of those things. So I had to really kind of think through what do I do because for me, I've had enough courses and training that it's sort of, you know, you, you make it your own. And so then it's like, well, what does my own look like? Um, so I think this is more or less what I do. And if not, I apologize for any sort of hypocrisy um, that we're building. But the point is we have to discipline ourselves to read the entire passage carefully. So let me give you two principles on what it means to do that. The first principle is let the text drive your understanding of it. And you're like, well, that doesn't sound very thoughty. But what do, I, what do I mean by that? I mean, leave your preconceived notions about what the passage says or means at the door. Yes, you'll be able to pick it up again at the door on your way out. But when you go to study a passage in the Bible, when you're doing your daily morning readings, I mean, maybe you're not going to do all 13 steps for your daily reading, um, but, but at least some of these I encourage you to do as you're studying the Bible on your own each day. Uh, Certainly, if you're going to be teaching anybody, I encourage this. But, but set aside those preconceived ideas about what the passage says or means. And at the same time, temporarily leave your theology and your politics at the door as well. Right? We can apply interpretations to Scripture based on years of the theology we've absorbed, whether that's through theology courses formally or whether that is through pastors preaching year, you know, week after week, year after year. We absorb a lot of theology without even thinking about it and it's important and it's good but first just try to understand what the passage says and then you will have to wrestle with how it fits into your theology and your politics and and again you want to let the text drive your understanding so sometimes that means your theology needs to change because as you encounter the words of scripture you begin to realize that this thing you always believed isn't exactly right and sometimes your politics might need to change because you begin to realize that, that you know, as you read the scripture, that maybe a Christian shouldn't be believing this or acting like this. So temporarily leave your belief about what the passage already says at the door. Temporarily leave your theology and politics at the door. They'll still be there when you leave. When you can, I guarantee you they'll still be there. And this is very, very hard for us. And so it sounds pedantic for me to say it. But it's actually really hard. And the more familiar we get with the Bible, the more times we've read it, the more courses we've taken, the harder it can be to leave behind our preconceived notion about what the passage means 
and what our theology says it should mean and what our politics says it should mean. So I'll give you a personal example because uh, this is one where I almost made this mistake recently with a Saturday night uh, message. And it's Mark chapter 4, verses 21 and 22. And I told them that Saturday night when I did it, that I had almost gone down this road of, of applying my assumed understanding to the passage. So Mark chapter 4, verses 21 and 22 says, And he said to them, Is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed and not on a stand? For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. Now when I started to work on that passage, I'm like, oh, a lamp shouldn't be put under a basket, shouldn't be put under a bed, not on a stand. I'm like, oh, I know this passage because it's in Matthew chapter 5. Right? And it tells us we have to do good deeds and good works and let our light shine to the world. Which is true, and that is what Matthew chapter 5 says. And yes, there Jesus uses an analogy related to the lamp and the lampstand and on a stand. And here he uses an analogy about a lamp and a lampstand and, you know, and not under the bed or the basket. But you know what? He's making a different point. Turns out that just like every other teacher, Jesus is allowed to use the same analogy to teach two different points. And the point of this passage is not let your light shine and do good work so that people see God. It's that Jesus is going to reveal all the secrets, so that there will be a day when all things that are secret are going to be revealed. And that is a radically different message. That is also true. It happens to be the meaning of this passage. And so I almost started to go down the usual spiel about shine your light, do good works, things like that, that fits Matthew 5, and I would have missed the point of the passage. So it is hard, right? Because that is, that is about Christ ultimately revealing all things. And so I want each of us, all of us, as we spend time in the Word, again, whether it's your daily readings or whether you're preparing for some kind of teaching you're going to do with your family or a in a Bible study or a group, commit to letting God's work, word speak for itself every time. Go, try to go in with as open a, a mind as to the meaning of the passage as you can and let the text drive your understanding. When you do that, you will be surprised how often the word of God is fresh and catches you with fresh insights you have not seen before. Little details that you do not remember and that you would not notice if you just plowed on to do what you were expecting to do with that passage. And I would tell you that if in your course of your study and your reading of the Bible, it isn't frequently surprising you or, or causing you to ask some tough questions, then it may mean you're not reading very carefully and you're not letting the text drive the understanding and the questions. And you may just be sort of applying your pre-installed, uh, you know, Christian, Baptist, American grid to it uh, without letting the text speak for itself. The second principle, again, none of this is rocket science, but I want to emphasize, I don't do things that are rocket science for the most part when it comes to studying scripture. Uh, hence, I want to teach things that all of you can do. Second principle, take time to understand the Bible, right? To understand the passage. Don't rush to apply. All right, this is, this is a case where we very often have been, and it's, I think years of Bible study does it to us, but we, uh, we are very quick to ask, what does this mean for me in my life? We go into the scripture wanting to know, what does this mean for me in my life? Ultimately, you do need to come out with that, but first invest your time in answering what does this mean. When you can answer that really well, then you have the material to really come up with powerful application in your life. Too often, as I said last week, we wind up with shallow applications because we have shallow understanding. We haven't wrestled with the passage long enough to understand what it means. And believe me, you know, as a pastor, one of the great temptations is, let me get on to the application part of this. All right, because that's what people like. They like the applications. Just tell me how to live my life so I can feel better and maybe I'll do some of it. 
But we have to wrestle with the understanding first. And, so, and, and the only answer is to discipline your mind and to catch yourself. You know, when you're, when, you're, when you're studying a passage and maybe you're making notes and you get a flash of insight about, your, about application, like, oh, I should not do this or I should do this, it's okay to write it down. But then try to intentionally reel your mind in. And say, let me just get back to understanding what the passage means. I will tell you that reading carefully is a skill that improves with practice. So when you invest the time, and it's going to feel like if you, if you actually do all of the 13 steps we're going to be building up to that are on the back of your handout, you're going to be like, this is forever. Well, first of all, this is the word of God, so it is worth investing a decent amount of time into. Um, but also understand that this gets easier to do and it gets faster to do. Not that, we're, not that our goal is speedy um, Bible study, but it does get easier and it becomes more just habit. And like I said, that's why I had to struggle to put this together because I had to figure out how to articulate what I typically do uh, in a way to say I think this is something that everyone can do uh, without uh, either being overly intimidating or... Uh, underly detailed. I don't know what the right word is there. So that's my encouragement. It's a skill that will improve with practice. So invest the time in it and know that it will get easier and it will get faster with practice. And you know, maybe sometime it'd be fun to start a small group that where we just focus on reading the Bible really well and like we just work through certain passages together and you know, in a Panera or something like that. And uh, you know, let's read the Bible well. I think that'd be pretty cool to do sometime. Somebody wants to start a group, there's an idea, and uh, I fully support your group. So let me begin to unpack a, a little bit of, a, of, of a, a process for reading carefully. So again, the back of the handout has some of this. Now, I'm going to give the step numbers, and you're going to notice I'm going to skip some. Because we're going to first deal with the reading carefully part, and that's certain ones of those 13 steps. And then I'm going to talk about the in context part. And that's certain other numbers. And so in the end, if you put the whole presentation together, you get what's on the back of the handout. And I'm not doing them in like willy-nilly order. I mean, they'll be in order within all the ones about reading carefully and then all the ones about reading in context. So let me offer up a process for reading carefully. Is this the only process? No. If you have learned a different process for how to read and study the Bible well, awesome. You know, wonderful and better teachers than I have written books and, and introduced processes and that's great, and if it's working for you, awesome. I do not mean to undermine that in any way. Uh, my goal is just to sort of give a process that, that I have found helpful uh, and that I believe all of you can, can find helpful too. So a process for reading carefully. Step one, pray first. Hopefully, hopefully you all do, but if you don't, I just encourage you very much, pray before you read the word. Uh, it doesn't, you don't have to pray for like 30 minutes. Just a simple prayer, you know, for God to, to speak to you through this passage, to, for him to help you in understanding, and for, for him to guard you from a, a careless or undisciplined reading that results in, in sort of wrong conclusions. Uh, it doesn't have to take long to, to just lift that prayer up. I, you know, every morning I lift up a simple prayer before I start my reading plan of the day, uh, before I when we study, uh, and in preparing. Right, because as we talked about back in session one, the most important tool we have for understanding the Word of God is the Holy Spirit within us. And so we want to ask the Holy Spirit to help us read the Word well. Right? We, we pray for our doctors to do a good job and have skill when they're doing surgery on us. So we should pray for our pastors, our Bible teachers, and ourselves to have skill when we are working with the Word of God. Uh, so I would encourage you to Always start with prayer. Step two. And honestly, this is one I struggle with sometimes. I have to discipline myself. And I'll explain why in a minute. Read the whole passage through from the beginning to the end. Right? So whatever your reading is that day, whether it's a passage for a Bible study, whether it's your reading plan, whether it's one you're getting ready to teach, read the whole passage through from beginning to end once. And maybe you're like, well, I always do. For some of you, that would be all you do, and that's okay to start. But I actually have this wrong, the temptation in the other direction of like, okay, I've read this passage a million times. Let me start breaking it out verse by verse and working on meanings and applications and implications and things like that so I can knock out the Bible study part of getting ready for Saturday night and Sunday morning messages and Wednesday night messages. 
So I have this temptation to <laughs> skip the whole, read the whole part of the whole passage part of it. Um, and part of that is, is, again, I've read it a lot. Part of it is at some point in the past, I've read the whole thing because I lay out a Bible study. I've usually read the whole book. I've broken the whole book into chunks. So to identify the passages for what I'm preaching through or whatever. So I'm good. I've read the passage once, you know, three months before or whatever when I was designing the Bible study. So read the whole passage through from beginning to end. And this is not like a really deep reading. I mean, you want to be attentive, uh, but you know, here you're really just trying to get the land, lay of the land. It's like you know, when you move into a new area and you're checking out all the restaurants and the, you know, looking for churches and schools and things like that. I mean, this is really just understanding the, the topography of the passage that you're going to be working through. And then I'm going to skip two steps that we're going to get to when we talk context. So we're going to get to step five, and here's where you're going to start. To, you may start to be like, Ryan, seriously? Uh, step five, identify the genre of the writing. Now, I think most people know what the word genre means. Like, you know, if you're talking about movies, action movies versus comedies versus dramas and rom-coms and documentaries and so forth. Well, our Bible books and even portions of books have genres as well. Right? Is it prose or poetry? Is it a historical narrative or is it an epistle? Is it a parable? You know, is it a prophecy? Is it an apocalypse? And we'll talk about what that means in a few weeks. Right? And it, and it matters quite a bit um, because there were conventions that went along with writing that type of writing. 2,000 years ago or 3,000 years ago. And understanding those conventions and what genre they are, they can help us understand the passage more accurately so we can read carefully and in context. And that's what we'll, part of what we'll be unpacking over these next four weeks from here um, as we look into these different genres of Bible writing. Just as an example, poems and prophecies both use very vivid imagery. And, and symbols to communicate, right? And, and Americans are not highly visual people for the most part. And our language is not highly visual, right? And so it challenges us to interpret poetry and prophecy in a way that someone in the Middle East today would not have because their language and their thought process is more intensely visual than the North American highly linear, highly verbal approach to language and writing. So we struggle more with some of the imagery. And years ago, I had some interesting uh, conversations with my, one of my coworkers who used to be a, a translator of many languages, but Arabic in particular. And he sort of, but he, and he was a Christian too. And so he sort of had all these insights into some of the just stuff, bizarre visuals that are used even today in Arabic, uh, you know, for like romantic poetry and things like that. And, you know, we look at, for example, Song of Solomon, and you're like, really? You say my hair is like goats, and that's a good thing? You know? And, well, in that culture, yeah, it speaks to them in a way that we're like, what on earth? So we have to have an awareness of genre. It doesn't define everything, but it is helpful. Hence, that's step five. Now we're ready to get close. Ready to, to zoom in, you know, fly low, and really begin to break the passage apart. So here I say, reread the passage slowly. And that, that, that speed is important. You have to discipline yourself. Read it slowly. You know, go verse by verse. Go sentence by sentence. And just don't be in a rush. We read in a rush. I read in a rush anyway. Um, everyone in Northern Virginia is in a rush all the time. So we tend to read the same way. So slow down. You know, uh, at times I'm better about doing my own translations or not, right? Which you don't need to do to understand. And people say, Was it, how is it helpful to, to do your own translation? And I say, honestly, the number one benefit I would get when I, would do, when I do translation is it forces me to slow down. Immensely slow down because I'm not super fluid. 
that slowness is where there's power because you're just you're forced to really take it a word at a time, a phrase at a time, a clause at a time, a sentence at a time, a verse at a time. All right, step seven, not exciting. Reread it at least one or two more times. Okay, so you read it once all the way through, high level. Now you've gone slow, and now I'm going to say read it again another time or two. And this is where I would encourage you, if you are studying, pick up the pen. If you haven't already, you know, because sometimes we have insights quick and we pick up the pen. Here you need to pick up the pen or the keyboard and start really taking notes about what is, just at this point, what's starting to stand out to you. Who are the major characters? Are there unusual features about this passage? Are there words or phrases being repeated? All right, are there pivotal words? Are there important comparisons? Are there commands? You know, what is beginning to stand out to you? And here, too, is where I would encourage you, if you've got a little bit of extra time, and hey, it's the Word of God, so we should all have a little extra time for that. <laughs> Consider reading the passage in one or two other translations that are good translations to detect different nuances, right? Because we all have this challenge, right? The, the Bible is coming forward to us from Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek. You know, the original text, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, and we have to put it into English. And anybody who speaks at least two languages of any sort knows that going from one language to the other is a little bit imprecise, right? Because a word over here may have a certain range of meanings, and there may be a corresponding word in this language that has a slightly different range of meanings, but the translators say the best word that matches this is this, but, but over here there's this range, and over here is a much smaller range. Now let me give you an extreme example of what range of meaning looks like. I'll just give you a, a I'm not going to go from one language to another, I'm just going to say in English. Let's talk about the word cell, C-E-L-L. -L. Am I talking about the thing you put prisoners in? Am I talking about the, the, the very small unit of biological you know, organization? Am I talking about the technology your telephone uses? All right, am I talking about certain kinds of batteries? Right, that's one word in English with four radically different meanings and there's yet more on the word cell. It's a very wide range. Now it's not nuanced particularly because there it's just all over the place, right? But when you correspond into a different language, you've got to figure out what's the, what's the right word, and then which, I doubt there's a word over here in Spanish or Russian or Italian or, or Chinese that covers all four of these. And so you got to say, okay, I'm assuming they did a good job of moving here to here, but what if there was a, what is a word that's a little more subtle? And I'm drawing, I'm not thinking of a great example, but I mean, there's, there's plenty of subtlety built into our language in our words, where we have very very subtle connotations, and maybe that same range isn't over here in the corresponding word in Chinese. Um, you know, it's kind of like, I don't know whether it's really true or not, but the whole thing about Eskimos having like 13 words for snow, and all we have is snow. But for them, they see the subtle range of nuance, you know, big snow, wet snow, whatever, I don't know. I don't know if it's true even, but, but it, it, it illustrates the idea well. And so that's where there's some value in looking at other translations that are pretty good, that are good, solid translations to try and, you know, detect without being knowledgeable at all in the underlying language. Where there is some nuance that begins to come out of that. Now at the extreme, and I don't recommend it, there's this thing called the Amplified Bible. I don't think that's actually helpful. Um, the Amplified Bible like takes every possible meaning of the word and throws them all together in a sequence. And so there it would talk about, you know, it would actually say, uh, and so-and-so went to a cell, telephone technology, biological unit of life, whatever, if the word was cell. That's not helpful. Um, so I don't consider that translation particularly helpful. But uh, the other thing is as you've been reading it and rereading it now, uh, yeah, and Karina on, online says, yes, she, she, she says exactly, some words don't even exist, right? And so, yeah, some words, you go from one language to another, they don't exist. So you have to do your best. Uh, and that's certainly true as you move from Hebrew and English and Greek into English. And so, again, multiple translations that 
good scholars have wrestled with to conclude can help you draw out that, that nuance that's there. So the last thought, I under reread it at least one or two more times, right? As you have now, you're starting to take notes on what stands out. If there are words you don't know or understand, spend time looking them up, right? Take the time to look them up. And, and it would be ideal to look them up in a Bible dictionary. I meant to bring my Bible dictionary up um, with me. Uh, you know, Webster's is okay. Dictionary.com is okay. Uh, but in that it is a Bible passage, it's a little better if you look it up in a Bible dictionary. Uh, if you go to BibleGateway.com, which is, by the way, where I always get all of my translations for copying into stuff, uh, they have all kinds of tools for free, and Bible Gateway has Bible dictionaries online for free. So, you know, if you see justification, and Paul is talking about justification, uh, you're going to be better off looking it up in a Bible dictionary than you are looking it up in Webster's. You know, because Webster's is going to say, oh, justification is like your reason for uh, doing whatever. Well, that's not what Paul means. Paul is talking about a legal judgment, uh, you know, by God that uh, you are declared not guilty uh, as a result of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on your behalf. Uh, oh, Karen says, according to a recent book, Eskimos actually have over 30 definitions of snow. Awesome. Uh, see, I love the Facebook community. So uh, I wasn't even making that whole Eskimo thing up. I just underestimated how many they have. So take some time to, to, to invest in those. There's not going to be that many words you probably don't know, but it's worth it, right? It's really, these concepts are important. And, and, and usually in a Bible passage, the word you don't understand is probably the one that's most important. Like justification, sanctification. You don't know what these mean? Look them up. All right, we're going we're gonna to skip a step and then go to step nine. <laughs> right, and here's, again, do you do this mechanically when you're taking notes and studying? Yeah, if you've got the time, please do, particularly if you're going to be teaching. Right, but if you don't have time, just think about it in your mind and at least think through it, right? Think through the five W's and take notes about that, right? Who, what, when, where, why. Now, to be clear, don't speculate. A big part of reading carefully is don't speculate. If the passage doesn't say it, the passage doesn't say it. If the passage doesn't say it, God didn't want you to know it. So don't speculate. So don't try too hard. If you can't answer the questions, you can't answer the questions. But who is being uh, talked to or about in the passage? Who is speaking or writing? Who is being addressed? What does the passage actually say? What is going on in the passage? When does it take place? Or when was it written? Where does it take place? Where or to where was it written? Why is this happening or being written? You know, and does the passage tell you why? Because some of them do. Now we're going a little deeper. Step 10. Look for and understand the purpose of connecting words. The very words we're most likely to maybe skim over because they're little and not very interesting are often critical to understanding the passage and the flow of what the author was thinking, what they were inspired by the Holy Spirit. That would be words like therefore, if, then, in likewise, in order that, in the same way, for, and, but, right, because they help us track the the thinking of the author building up to whatever the main point is. All right? And ultimately our goal is to drive out the main point. We want to understand the main point of the passage. And we'll talk about that. That's, that's really like two steps down. But our goal is to, at the minimum, we want to understand the main point the, that the Holy Spirit is trying to communicate. If we don't get the main point, all the rest of the work is wasted and we're going to wind up very wrong. If we do get the main point, even if we kind of mess up some of the other stuff, we're not going to be that far off the mark. So, so we want to get to the main point. And so, so that these words help us, right? If you see a therefore, that means that, that the stuff that came before it is the reason for the stuff that's about to come. So if you don't understand the stuff that came before it, or it wasn't part of the passage you're studying, you might need to step back and, and read that. That's part of our context section. But... Uh, 
If you don't understand the stuff that came before it, then you're not going to be that, that powerfully impacted by the, the stuff on, the, on this side of the therefore. I mean, I'll give you an example. Romans chapter 12, right? Verse 1. Therefore, what? living sacrifice, right? Be a living sacrifice. Verse 2, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Do not be conformed to the patterns of this world. But it all begins with a therefore. What's the thing that points to the therefore? The first 11 chapters of the book of Romans. All of them. Paul changes direction from, okay, here's all the theological truth of who you are in Jesus Christ that I have unpacked in 11 chapters of the letter to the Romans. And now we're getting to the part of, because of who you are in Jesus Christ, this is how you need to live as a follower of Jesus Christ. And that's a normal pattern in Paul's writing. At some point, he, most of his letters are structured where the first half is some, you know, first portion, I won't say half. Sometimes it's 80%, sometimes it's 20%. The first portion of most Paul letters are who we are in Jesus Christ. And then the next part, the last part, is usually the, therefore... This is what you need to do because you are in Jesus Christ. Um, and he always has some kind of transition word or phrase. And like I said, therefore, is a, is a common one. Um, but there's lots of them. Um, I'm not going to introduce you. You know, I was taught a way where, and sometimes I will use it or break down to do something like it when it's a really tough passage where you can actually, it's not like diagramming a sentence, but you're di diagramming the whole argument, the whole flow of the passage, and with all kinds of symbology and stuff like that based around these, branching on these little words and things like that. But that's painful, and I don't do that very often. Um, so I'm not going to, I won't, I won't teach that. Uh, the thing is, you know, these words are not there by accident. They are intentionally connecting this passage with other passages. They are building an argument. They are building a story. They are the things that lead up to or indicate the main point of the passage. So we need to be aware of those little words. And you will encounter Bible study methods that involve circling them and underlining them. And that's not a bad discipline at all. Because it helps you uh, understand the... Uh, that, that construction, the intentionality of the construction. All right, so number 11, while we're looking at the topic of words, think about any words that are repeated in the passage, right? And this is one that I, I will often see, you know, where it's like, oh, I didn't realize that. You know, you begin to realize as you take the time to read a passage carefully that certain words will be repeated sometimes. And we need to think about that because there's no accidents in Scripture. And so quite often these may be pointing to themes that we need to, to draw out. These may be things that point us to what the main point of the passage is. I'll, I'll give you an example. One time I was re reading through the Gospel of Matthew in one sitting. And there is value in doing that sometimes. Like just sit down and read an entire book of the Bible like you would read any other book. Um, so read the Gospel of Matthew in one sitting. It's not a deep study method. You're there. You're trying to get a broad overview. But it's powerful because, you know, what I realized was Matthew uses the word authority a lot. A lot. So I went through and sort of highlighting everywhere, you know, he used the word authority. Because he's communicating something, right? He's communicating something about Jesus through his repeated use of authority. And there's this whole theme. Who has authority and who doesn't have authority? You know, and so even when it's not explicitly being called out, it is implicitly throughout all 28 chapters of the Gospel of Matthew making it clear. Who's got authority? Jesus has authority. By the way, what's the very ending of Matthew's Gospel? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, going back to our previous point, what do we do because of that? Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded. Why would we do that? Because all authority has been given to him in heaven and on earth. And surely I will be with you till the end of the age. So think about words that are repeated and the significance. Likewise, on Saturday nights, I pre I've been preaching through the Gospel of Mark. And so as I've been doing that, I've been struck by the number of times that the idea of clean and unclean are brought forward. 
thematically in the, so many of the stories, so often in the wording, even most of the time when he talks about demons, he refers to them unclean spirit. So Mark is developing this very uh, deep theme about the cleanness that is only available through Jesus Christ in contrast to the pollution of the world and the satanic kingdom and, and all of that. So look for those repeated words. So there's not always there, right? But it's valuable to think about it. So step 12 is to determine the author's main point. Now, sometimes the authors are helpful and they tell you what the main point is. There may be a phrase or a saying that's directly in the passage that is the main point. We're going to talk about that um, particularly the week we talk about narratives, um, because we always want to understand the main point of any passage. We particularly want to do it in a narrative. There's a few tools that make it real easy most of the time to tell what the main point of a narrative is. Uh, so we want to, and a lot of times it's, it's spoken, you know. I'll tell you if it's a narrative that involves Jesus, most of the time the main point is the last thing he says in the passage. That's usually the main point. But that's just your tip for two weeks from now when we talk narratives. You know, to think of it as, so it's a down payment. Um, if it's not stated in words, take the time to write out what the main point of the passage is in your own words. Understand how the author supports that main point, right? Scripture does not just stand in isolation. These main points aren't just floating around like, like you know, little gold nuggets or something like that. They, the scripture builds to it. So think about how the author has built to that main point, whether it's by telling a story or through a poem or through a prophecy or through teaching or through argumentation. And as I already said, you know, if you understand the main point, you're not going to go too far wrong. Even if you mess up all the other parts of what I just said. And if you do all the other parts of what I just said perfectly and you don't get the main point right, you're going to be off base in a bad way. Um, that's one of the ones I try really hard on, you know, because honestly, some of the people who are worst about detecting the main point are preachers. Because sometimes we want to make a point that happens to not be the point of the passage. And so we will try and bend the passage and bend our teaching and bend our analysis to make the point. And that is wrong. That is scripture abuse. Uh, we can't do that. We shouldn't do that. Uh, and so get the main point. Take the time to understand the main point. Final recommendation, if you got the time, create your own paraphrase of the passage. You know, if you can paraphrase the passage yourself, you probably grasp it pretty good. You know, and I do usually as I'm going through and building up a little bit of a paraphrase of my own uh, what's going, going on in the passage. Because I find that helpful. So, that was a lot. I want to pause for, for questions and comments, and then I'm going to figure out how to get through the context material in, in a lot less time. But let me stop for questions on reading carefully. Any comments? There. Everyone's got it, or they're just afraid to ask? Or you already know and you're like, Brian, you're wasting my time. And that's, I, I respect that and I apologize. Okay, I'll make it. <laughs> yes, Linda. Just because it came to my mind. But this is very similar to uh, the one story that um, yes. the young adults are using. I think Evie was where she was. She, she was here earlier, there. but she's not yeah, here. So yeah. the young adults are, are uh, using a book that walks you through some of these. Yes. Um, and it's, it's wonderful. And uh, I've never heard this before. So, uh, and, but that's because I just finished making it up yesterday. <laughs> Yes. Um, it was very good. And I'm gonna I'm gonna encourage young adults to stream or to listen to your uh, Bible your Oh yeah, that'd be session. awesome, yeah. Yeah, so this is great. It's on, it's the right time. I, I appreciate that, yes. All right, so let me talk about part two and I'll say hi to more folks out in, in Facebook, Carissa, Carla, Karina, a lot of people with car names. Uh, I can only see so much of the stream right now going by on the, on the laptop, but uh, let's talk about context. Part two, always, always, always read in context. Always, 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 please, please, I beg you, in the name of Jesus, read in context. Let's talk about what context means. We exist in several contexts, right? We live, we live in, in Lake Ridge, we live in the D.C. area, we live in the United States, we live in 2020, and all of those influence kind of who we are and they shape us. 
a, a good bit. Now, likewise, every Bible passage exists in context. It exists in literary context, right? The, the material that surrounds it in the Bible. Paragraphs, chapters, sections of books, entire books, the testament that it's sitting in, and then the entire Bible. And that's why we did the big story of the Bible last week. And then there is the context of culture and history, right? The culture that is described at the time and a particularly importance to us, the location in redemptive history. Again, that's the concept we introduced last week with the big story of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, the unfolding of God's redemptive work through Jesus Christ from the beginning to the end of the Bible. And so context is key to understanding. And generally, the closer the context, the more relevant, right? So, so if my passage is here, usually this context that's close by it is more significant in inter understanding, interpreting, and applying than this context. It all matters, but usually the closer in, the better, right? And sometimes this will get into issues of interpretation and where people will be arguing about, well, what does this passage mean? And they'll, they'll pull out like, well, over here it says this, so it's probably that. Well, two sentences before it actually said what it was going to be talking about, so why don't we focus on the context that's very close in. You would be surprised the number of theological debates that exist because people want to interpret a passage here using something over here instead of something that's given by the author right next to it. It's a lot, right? We do it a lot. And, and the thing is, we're like, wow, that's super smart that they can pull this thing from over here. And, and it is good that they know the word. And it is good to be linking across the, the scripture as we can. But again, if there's immediate context, that has to take precedence. Most of the time. Every rule has an exception. I'm not even going to try to pretend there aren't exceptions to every rule. Um, so immediacy within the Bible is usually most important. There is, I will say, at least one thing that you can routinely say breaks that sense of immediacy. And that is when, for example, the New Testament is quoting the Old Testament. Because then it makes very relevant what's going on in that Old Testament passage. Whenever we see the New Testament quoted in the Old Testament, we should go and look up that passage that's in the Old Testament. And we should understand its context, at least a few verses before and after, to understand. Now, how can you do that? Well, study Bibles help a lot with that because they have in the margin, they tell you what the passage is that it's linked to, um, as do the notes in the bottom. All right, so if you're not a, a super-duper uh, expert at identifying every uh, Old Testament reference in the New Testament, get a study Bible. It will help you with that. Um, the other thing that's really cool, and I just sort of realized, I think it's standard. The CSB, the Christian Standard Bible, fairly recent translation, came out in 2017. It actually, as near as I can tell, because I've got two CSBs, one's a regular, one's a study Bible. They both bold when the New Testament is quoted in the Old Testament. It's kind of neat. Um, it's helping me make some connections that I would not have otherwise realized there was even anything going on there. Uh, so it's always worth following that reference back. All right, reading in context is so very critical and... Uh, and why does it matter? Why is it so important? Well, unless, I mean, here I'm going to be a little bit provocative, right? Unless you think the Bible was randomly slapped together by people who are not very smart, then you have to think that context is key because you have to assume that they knew what they were doing when they wrote, right? When we write, we try to write in a certain way that's intelligent and makes a point. We don't always succeed, but we try. But these authors are working on an inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So the context matters. Right? Because they're not just randomly doing stuff. If you think the Gospels are a random hodgepodge of episodes of stories in Jesus' life, you need to read them more carefully. Because they are not. And even the parts that seem random, like where is this or where is that? If you spend time to think about it, you're like, oh, I get it now. Um, so... In that is the Holy Spirit is inspiring the books to be written in a certain way. Immediate context is never an accident in the Bible. Um, reading in context means understanding and interpreting a passage as it fits within that entire book and within God's work of redemptive history and within the whole Bible. And I will tell you, reading in context is the most important thing we can do to avoid a really serious misinterpretation or misapplication of Scripture. Every pseudo-Christian cult out there thrives on taking verses out of context. They all do. 
And if you're not biblically literate and you're not willing to go back and look at the passage and look at the context, it's easy to fall prey to what they say. There's been a whole lot of spiritual abuse and legalism and moralism in church history that stems from a failure to read carefully in context. And I'm hoping I can get enough time to give you some examples on, on that. So I'm going to try and go a little bit quick. So reading in context prevents heresy on the one hand. It also helps us avoid disappointment. What do I mean by that? Um, we, are, we may be wrongly tempted to claim a promise of God for ourselves that was never meant for us. I'll give you an example of that in a minute. And it's everyone's favorite. And every youth group has it tattooed on their ankles. Joe already knows what I'm going to talk about. So let's talk process for reading in context. So we merge these steps in with that other thing. That results in what you've got on the back of the handout. So step three, identify the complete unit of thought containing the passage, right? So we did our, I think we did our, our, our step one, which was a you know, quick uh, prayer. Step two was reading the whole passage quickly. So step three is what I call identifying the unit of thought. What does that mean? I know I can't come up with like a really good word for that. Um, the point is that there are natural divisions in every book of the Bible that represent completed thoughts before the author moves from kind of one thing to the next thing. Um, and you should never study less than an entire unit of thought. Even if you're only going to really be talking about one or two verses, you should never work with a passage shorter than the full unit of thought. And, and I don't, maybe I'll bring some examples next week to help you all understand what I mean by that. Um, but for example, part of my sermon preparation process, months in advance, right, when I'm first in laying out a sermon series, I will go through a Bible... And so I'll bring up my working Bible next week so I can give you examples. I will go through and I will just, as I read the book of the Bible, I will just put dashes, lines, marking the breaks in the author's thought as they transition from one thought to the next. Because I do not preach less than a complete unit of thought. So that I, to protect myself from doing evil with the word of God. Um, be wary of people who preach one verse as a sermon. If I do occasionally do that, it's, I'll always bring in the full unit of thought somewhere in the course of the sermon so that you can have trust that I'm handling the word well because you should trust that I'm handling the word well. So never study less than a complete unit of thought because it's not complete if you don't, right? And so you may miss some, some key stuff. Realize that units of thought can cross chapter barriers because the, bar the chapter markings in your Bible are not inspired by the Holy Spirit. They were added hundreds of years later. They are usually helpful. They are not always helpful. And an author's unit of thought can cross the barrier of a chapter. A unit of thought could be a paragraph. Usually it's at least a paragraph. Could be a chapter. Sometimes it is. Um, for example, I'd say 1 Corinthians 13, other than the part where the very beginning of that unit of thought is actually the end of chapter 12, and they put a chapter marker in completely the wrong place. Um, so the last part of the last verse of chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians actually belongs with 13, but the rest of 13 is a solid unit of thought. It could also be several chapters, and you see this most commonly in your Old Testament histories. Um, you know, an extended story related to David or something like that can run two, three chapters. Uh, one time I stuck Neil with three chapters of the book of Daniel because the last three chapters of the book of Daniel are sort of one complete thought. And I and like, can't break it up. I've got to deal with the whole thing. Good luck with three chapters of the book of Daniel. Um, and he did great with it. So that's, that's understanding the complete unit of thought. That also is just a skill. Once you practice this, you'll begin to see it. Um, so I'll bring some examples next week as, as part of our process of studying the Old Testament. Um, step four. So whatever your passage is, if your passage is, is less than a chapter, make sure you read the whole chapter that contains the passage. And then I really encourage you. Oh, Karina, we miss you too. She says she misses us all. So Everyone say hi. We miss you. There's a lot of people who miss you. Uh, so read that chapter, then read the chapter before it, and the chapter that comes after it. So yes, I'm asking you to read three chapters of the Bible. And I will apologize for that. You aren't studying those chapters in the same kind of depth or detail. You just need to survey them to understand how your passage fits in. 
So read, read that paragraph just before and after your passage, especially closely. So it's like I'll read the whole chapter before, and it'll be kind of a light read, and then I'll get to the last paragraph, and it'll be a detailed read, and then I study. In a perfect world, you read the whole book, but I understand. Um, and again, if you have things like study Bibles, they actually will have helpful book summaries and outlines that can help you with your studying without having to sit back and read the whole book right then and there. Okay, item eight, and this is the money one, and I don't have a lot of time, so I guess I'm just going to spill it into next week a little bit, um, which is fine, because this is an important topic, and I'm not going to cut it short. Uh, think about how the passage fits into its immediate biblical context, and then you move outwards, all right? So, so the closest in verses, how does it fit? And then you radiate a little bit out, or those, those chapters you just read. How does it fit in those chapters you just read? Okay, how does it fit in the book? And understand this. Think about this, and... And pay attention to the connecting words that get you into the passage. You know, like I mentioned, Romans 12, 1. It begins with the therefore. So you got to think about what was going on in chapter 11, right? And think about that so you know what got you in. So if you're studying Romans 12, 1 and 2, right? Two verses, which are, I think, a complete thought unit, if I remember right. So it's the shortest two verses in this case. Um, but think about that word that got you in, the therefore. Think about what gets you out. Uh, pay particular attention to conjunctions and prepositions. Note any words that might be common between your passage and the surrounding material. Because they might indicate themes you can't uh, merely... Oh no, my laptop shut down. So now I can't see anybody's comments. Uh, they can't merely study in isolation with car So let me give you an example. Maybe one money example. So that you'll come back next week um, wanting more examples of verses we take out of context. Uh, and why we should read better. So I'm going to go to every youth group's favorite verse, right? What is every youth group's favorite verse? Jeremiah 29 11. Jeremiah 29 11. Yeah, Philip's over here. He, we have great conversations about Jeremiah 29 11 in the office um, because it is so abused. So everyone loves it, right? For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. That is awesome. Let's work on the context. Let me read the verse before. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare, not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. What? That's not for us in America today? He was writing to exiles in, in Babylon and saying that he's going to end their 70 years of exile, bring them home, wait, right? And then we go on and let, let's read a little further. Then, then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I've driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. Okay, I'm really not feeling this about America right now. I'm not feeling this for our youth group. Amen. Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 1, right? We, we want to read the whole, the whole chapter. That's part of our technique. These are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Oh, that's who the promise is for. This verse and passage is about God's faithfulness to the remnant of his people in exile in Babylon. It is not a promise to you or me. Now, let me set your heart at ease. God does indeed mean good things for you. Romans 8, 28, right? Tells us that God works all things to the good for those who love him. It's an important clause right there. Ephesians 2.10, which is the one I really feel should be tattooed on the ankle of everyone in a, in a youth group. Because right? it's a lot better. Right? It's a greater promise. It applies to every Christian. And it's so encouraging, particularly in a world where the culture is telling us that there's no meaning in our life. Right? Ephesians 2.10 offers us this encouragement. For we are his workmanship, 
created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them, right? So, so yes, God has plans for us. He has prepared good works for us to do. And we matter because he prepared good works for us. We matter because we're his workmanship. So tattoo that on your ankle, not Jeremiah 29, 11. So uh, next week, I will pick this up and finish it, and, and, and this part, and then we'll talk about interpreting uh, and understanding Old Testament passages. Uh, next week, I'm going to give you the encouragement. Good news. Despite what you, despite the obvious implication of the verse that people use every time they gather with people to pray, turns out we are not actually alone and without God when we are beside, by ourselves. Right, Matthew 18, 20, everyone likes to, when they get together, like, oh, we're two or more gathered, there am I. Have you ever thought about the obvious reverse of that? Like you're sitting by yourself, does that mean God's not there? No, of course not. So we will talk about what that passage actually means in context um, so that we avoid that and maybe even avoid making that statement. Well, hey, at least two of us are here, so God's here. Well, God is here when there's only one of you, too. God is omnipresent if you go back to our attributes of God, so God's everywhere, but uh, he's particularly with us as believers. So let me just offer a word of prayer and then, then uh, throw the keys to the choir to, uh, to take this car off in a whole new direction. <laughs> Father God, we thank you for uh, just all who gather here and online who have invested this time to, to seek to study your word better and more effectively and more accurately, Lord. And so I just praise you for that. I praise you for just the wonders of your word. And, and I just pray that you will work in our lives and, and, and perhaps use these, my feeble efforts to, in some way uh, to just make us all better students of the Bible so that we can truly seek to understand your word and, and hunger more and more throughout our lives to understand better and better so that we can apply better and better, so that we can live who you have called us to be in Jesus Christ, Lord. And this is just the, the prayer we lift up, and we lift it up in the mighty name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.